Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the November edition of The Landlord Lens. It's the collaboration between Property Tribes, of which I'm the co-founder and also a full-time residential landlord, and the NRLA. And my co-host for this webinar is, of course, NRLA CEO, Mr. Ben Beadle, otherwise known as the busiest man in the private rented sector. <laughs> um, how are which, you doing, which, Ben? Which because is why you... I'm a bit late today. Sorry. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, we apologize to everybody for the, the slight technical difficulties, but here we go. Um, ben, um, there's so much to talk about and so much has happened in the last sort of 48 hours as well in our sector that we can touch on before we start looking at, at the kind of trending topics that have been uh, engaging the audience on property tribes. Um, now, first of all, I just want to roll back a little bit to, to the conference because what an amazing day. Uh, sold out over a thousand landlords Mr. Michael Gove on the video link up, answering questions, looking landlords directly in the eyes. Um, amazing day, Ben. I bet I bet you've had so much feedback, positive feedback. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it far surpassed my expectations. It was a great day. Um, it was excellent to get the issues across to the people that matter. Michael Gove, uh, Clive Betts, chair of the Leveling Up Select Committee, but it was also a great event uh for uh our suppliers as well and and landlords being able to hear from you know uh the very best from their respective areas it was spot on it was lovely well congratulations to the whole team that pulled it off because i, I was there and i thought it was absolutely awesome and it really raised the bar and set a new standard um of of events for landlords so already looking forward to the next one. Um, now, I guess your feet haven't really touched the ground since then, have they? Um, you've been busy this morning. Um, tell us a little bit about what you've done this morning. So, yes, I was at Port Cullis House giving evidence at the Rents Reform Bill Committee. Um, and this committee uh, it works differently to, say, a select committee. Uh, it's considering particular elements of the bill um, and where we want to see amendments. So it's not about me rocking up and saying, don't abolish Section 21, don't do this, don't do that. Um, actually, it's very specific. Um, it turned out not to be terribly specific, to be honest with you, but that's the purpose of these of these of these bills. And hopefully it won't surprise uh, the listeners to know that we've made a full submission in terms of the amendments that we would like to see to the bill. And I was speaking uh, to, to those things uh, earlier, which, you know, um, again, won't come as any surprise, but it's about making sure that landlords uh, to benefit from a moratorium from tenants. It's about uh, making sure that the antisocial provisions are not watered down uh, further, that they can work for responsible landlords. Uh, it's also about making uh, uh, amends uh, in relation to the student sector as far as we can. All of those, all of those types of things. So a bit of fine tuning, really. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it change is coming. So, you know, anybody that's out there that is disappointed, that, you know, that we've not said we don't want to see the renters reform bill, I'm afraid um, whether uh, the blues bring it or whether the reds uh, bring it in a year's time, um, it is coming. And the the forum today uh, was made up of a, a very large committee of about 17 uh, MPs with a chair appointed by uh, the Speaker of the House to consider the very finer points of the bill. Um, and we had um, uh, a session before me, but they're sitting all day uh, hearing from different elements. And I've just finished um, with Dr. Julie Rugg uh, here uh, in our London office, um, uh, who's going to give uh, evidence this afternoon as well. So, yeah, really, really interesting. And then it, that sort of closes, I think, we're due to hear on the 5th or, or 6th of December. So there's a whole lot of horse trading uh, to kind of go on. And again, you know, we will be leveraging our influence with uh, MPs and peers to make sure we get the amendments that we want. The difficulty is so will uh, so will others. And then I didn't feel there was a lot of consensus uh, today, Vanessa. Um, you know, I very much... Uh, you know, like to find areas of commonality. Um, but when you have uh, Shelter and others uh, calling for a two-year 
moratorium during which uh, landlords can't give a no fault notice, um, then you know you you do recognise that we are, are are some way apart on on these things, which is a pity. Mm, indeed. Well, in the last, um, I don't know, 24 hours, we've had a new housing minister, uh, Lee Rowley, who uh, was housing minister very briefly when uh, Liz, Liz Truss had her very short uh, uh, premiership. Um, he, uh, I believe I'm right in saying, is uh, the seventh housing minister since 2020 and the 16th in over um, the last 13 years. So it really has been a revolving door of housing ministers. Um, wondered, Ben, have you had any interactions with um, Lee Rowley to this point? Have you got any thoughts about um, how he's going to operate? Well, uh, although he replaces McLean, um, what we don't know yet is whether PRS brief will sit. He wasn't at the committee hearing um, uh, this morning. Gove wasn't. Gove wasn't there. The Leveling Up Minister uh, was there. And so, what we have to wait and understand is, although that he replace, although he is replacing uh, McLean, where is the responsibility for the bill and the PRS going to sit? That could also move around. So, um, at this stage, we don't know yet. Um, can I just say? Hey, though, Vanessa, I think it's absolutely appalling, uh, frankly, that, that we've had uh, this this change. And it's no wonder that housing uh, is in such a mess when it's treated so much as a political football. Um, you you yep. know, whether or not the, the, the minister was was up to scratch will be for others to judge. What I can tell you is I met her on a number of occasions. I found her to be uh, on her brief uh, and on the money. Uh, and of course, you know, you don't agree on on everything, um, uh, but she certainly understood the issues that we were raising. And that's why we have seen, you know, success, I say success. We've certainly seen the Secretary of State come out and announce that Section 21 won't be abolished until such time the courts are ready to uh, receive such cases. Now, that's slightly vague and wishy-washy, but it's a, a helpful uh, intervention, I think, and a recognition that you know that landlords are being are being listened to. So, I, I, I mean, you know, I can't honestly see um, how anybody can get to grips with a brief as wide as housing mm. um, in such a sh short space of time. And as I posted on social media yesterday. Um, we enjoyed good engagement with Rachel. She was a nice lady. She understood the issue. She understood the sector. She put her kids through uni. She knew the student market. She knew what we were talking about. Um, you know, she had a, a, a genuine interest in housing and, and planning. Mm. Um, I cannot see for the life of me why you would chop her the day before uh, such a significant event uh, mm -hmm. of the of the uh, of the committee that we've had today. Uh, clearly, there are other issues at, at, at play here, but it's really unhelpful. Really unhelpful. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. There's just been no continuity for so many years, and as you say, it is a very wide brief, and a new person that comes into the role has so much information to assimilate to even start to begin to get their thinking straight about how how they want to uh, work in the sector. It, it, it's just a, a nightmare to have that complete lack of continuity and at such a critical time uh, in our sector. So um, I guess with Lee Rowley, it's going to be watch this space. We don't even know how long yeah. he'll be there. Well, yeah, indeed, if we're going for an election uh, next year, I suspect he's not going to be there terribly uh, long but he you know as you say he he did have uh, a similar post before though he wasn't uh, responsible for the prs brief um so once we once we ascertain exactly where the private rented sector is to sit we will start making some inroads i have met him a couple of times seems like a nice chap but um uh, yeah we'll we'll see what happens but uh, you know listeners can um uh appreciate hopefully that you know we will be like the proverbial rat up a drain pipe uh, <laughs> once that is announced so that we can make um the best impression that we can on behalf of landlords and the sector mm. 
it must be just so frustrating because you invest time in building a rapport and a relationship with with each minister and then they're gone and you have to start from scratch so i'm sure it must be very frustrating to have to do that um we're just going to jump back to uh, your work this morning um, at the committee. Alex uh, Schinder says, Ben, you seem to say this morning you were happy with the proposals, which seem to require a high level of evidence if a judge has to decide. Uh, Alex wondered if you could elaborate on that. Uh, I, I'm happy with what has been set out uh, in terms of the antisocial behaviour provisions. And, and I should say that, um, you know, Gove and the Prime Minister have accepted a number of points uh, when it comes to antisocial behaviour. The bit that we like um, is that the test has been widened. So what's written at the moment um, uh, is not what we're going to en end up with. We're expecting some amendments actually later today. Um, I should have told you, Vanessa, before coming on, but there, there will be a left that yeah, I'm probably giving too much away now, but there are some amendments coming uh, later today slash tomorrow that deal with this. And uh, my my point here is, uh, and, you know, we're getting a lot of pushback when it comes to antisocial behaviour. If you watch the session with Shelter you know, uh, and um, Citizens Advice, you know, they were very concerned about that wording. Well, I'm, uh, you know, we have to have a wider um, uh, wording threshold, call it what you will, that's easier to prove antisocial behaviour and gives judges, you know, the, the latitude to make that sort of decision. Is it perfect? Is it going to be as easy as Section 21? I'm afraid it's not going to be. But I made the, 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 you know, the point earlier that we have to be in the position of where we are on the side of the victims of antisocial behaviour and not left with the perpetrators in the property. Um, whether or not this will work as intended, I cannot be 100% sure. Um, but with the amendment that is coming, um, it's it's certainly better than we could have hoped for. The challenge for us is to make sure that it doesn't get watered down any further and that that test becomes impossible to prove. That's what I want to uh, avoid. OK, well, thank you for that. Well, let's move on now to the first of our trending topics. And if you're new to this uh, webinar and the format of it, this is where Ben and I uh, briefly discuss the topics that have been trending on Property Tribes. Um, it's very similar to how Twitter comes up with trending topics. We have a little algorithm that sorts everything in the background and creates an updated trending list about every three hours or so. And it's a very good barometer of, of what's on landlords' minds. Um, and when Ben and I first came up with the format of this webinar, we thought that it would be a really good way to make uh, what we're talking about very current and relevant because it's of the moment uh, and Ben um, I'm afraid that one of the issues uh, is the uh, parore that's been going on in the tax planning sector over um, the last uh, few weeks um, obviously I think everybody's aware now um, that uh, HMRC have issued a spotlight against um, the hybrid method of tax planning, uh, which was being undertaken by a company um, that the NRLA uh, had an association with. Um, and Ben, I think with all these tax planning schemes, of, of which there are several, they're so complex, it's very hard for landlords to know where they stand. And our attitude uh, property tribes was to allow discussion about them to tease out the issues mm. about them um, but ultimately unless HMRC lay down the law about them you, you just don't know and even then if it goes to court HMR can be overturned by a judge so landlords have been following these schemes since 2015 when section 24 first came in uh, why has HMRC waited eight years to, you know, come up with this verdict? Um, it's been a very difficult time for landlords with with all these exposés of of, of uh, tax planning schemes that Dan Needle at Tax Policy Associates has, has also been undertaking. What what what's your take on that? Well, yeah, my take on this is that we all want to pay 
our fair share, but we also want to pay uh, uh, as as little as we reasonably can within the confines of the law, right? So, uh, but this has become far more pronounced. It's become far more pronounced because of things like Section 24 um, uh, that's forcing uh, uh, landlords to, you know, either reconsider their investments or to move sector or to uh, incorporate um, and, you know, it's why I referenced earlier that the it, uh, the Renters Reform Bill Committee, that actually the, the, the reform bill will do nothing substantive to help supply and the problems around supply like taxation. Uh, and so, you know, in, in some respects, it's very much an unintended consequence of landlords revisiting their, their business plans. Uh, and ultimately, you know, much like uh, how um, you know laws get tested about whether you know notice has been served correctly or not, it's the same, uh, exactly the same in this type of scenario as well. And I think that you know everybody uh, has done their their due diligence here, but clearly, um, uh, you know, HMRC have have taken a slightly different different tact. They have. And in the last, I think, 24 hours, letters have gone out to landlords that have entered into a hybrid tax planning arrangement, inviting them to come clean with HMRC uh, and pay the tax that they owe, hopefully with reduced penalties and interest, because it's the kind of uh, HMRC can offer a kind of amnesty uh, situation. Um, it's just I, I just can't fathom, Ben, why it's taken them so long to have a ruling on this. Our landlords have so much uncertainty, as you've said. We're being hammered by Section 24. Some of these schemes appeared very credible. Um, you know, I think landlords are caught in the middle of all this, to be honest. Yes, they are. Uh, they absolutely are. And, you know, it is uh, really unfortunate. Uh, we are where we are. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it is very, very regrettable, I think, that um, uh, that it has taken a while uh, to, to, you know, to come around to this way of thinking. And I think that certainly the the firms that are are involved have been very um, uh, rigorous and and, um, and confident in what they are offering and including, you know, a number of cases that have been through uh you know uh, assessments by hmrc on the very model that hmrc are now are now questioning um uh, you know rules change I, I i i get that but i i absolutely share uh those people's frustrations that are maybe caught up in it mm, indeed Let's move on to our second topic then. Um, and this was a, a sort of mini poll by one of our members. Uh, and it was asking, will you be a landlord in five years time? And she was interested to know uh, which part of the country you were in and uh, if, if you were staying in uh, by to let which part of the country you're in and, and, and what your intentions were for the future. Um, and I, I, I think this is a question that a lot of landlords are actually asking themselves at this moment in time. Many of us um, have been in the game for a, a long time and may have been thinking about retiring in maybe 10 years. And we've brought that kind of event horizon forward and thinking actually, Hmm, maybe I've had enough, maybe I am going to start selling up. So uh, it is a universal question uh, for a lot of landlords, just because of all the, the pressures that we're facing. Um, ben, have you um, have you ever thought about answering that question? Will you be a landlord in five years time? Mm, I will be. Um, whether I'll have the same number of properties, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I sold a, um, a, a studio flat a couple of years ago um, just because, not because of any other reason other than it was a bit of a pain to, to, to manage and I, I, it wasn't giving me a great return, to be honest with you. So I, I, I got shot of it. Um, but that was a decision that I took like everybody else would, would take. It was well before the you know, interest rates um uh, uh went up so significantly but i you know i've got I, I mean i've got one eye on the student changes to be honest with you 
and how that will affect, as you know, I, I've got three or four properties in the uh, student market in West London. Um, and, you know, the the changes that are coming down the track without amendment will cause it to uh, not work. Uh, and I've been very clear about the impact they will have on the student sector. But I've also got other, you know, uh, properties that are let out to, to different cohorts of, of people. Um, and, and I'm not too worried uh, about the uh, the wider changes. What I am worried about is tax and mortgages. I've got two that are coming off of fixed terms, one at the end of this month, one in, in February. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's it's making it stack up, particularly against the backdrop of, of taxation. I'm, I'm not an incorporated uh, landlord, so I suffer... Uh, uh, like everybody else at the hands of, of Section 24. And so, you know, I will make my assessment like everybody else will in terms of, is it a going concern? Um, and I think there are a lot of people that are looking at their their investments and, and weighing it up. And, uh, you know, it, it depends what you're there for as well, though, Vanessa, doesn't it? You know, mm. if, you, if you're looking at capital appreciation, um, well, you know, you may not be too bothered about it, but actually, if you're if you're looking at the the sort of monthly return and uh, and, and weighing up a mortgage, you might you might think differently. Um, that said, um, you know, I, I still believe that that property is a good investment, and I get that you know there's people that are browbeaten out there. If you've been in the property sector for thirty years, I can well see you looking at these changes and thinking can't hack it um and you know that's your that's your that's your choice um uh, for me it's a simple question of economics i'm not going to invest in something that i don't turn a modicum of profit on and as i've said on this webinar before you know that's not an offensive word you know we have to be really realistic about why people invest in housing um yes there's some accidental landlords out there i get that but the vast majority of people do it for their retirement for their pension, for their mm. children. Um, and they still have very much a role in this sector. Uh, whether the blues or the reds uh, like landlords is irrelevant. They need landlords. And so, you know, even uh, with the opposition and we, we were uh, uh, running a fringe event uh, with Labour, you know, they are begrudgingly accepting that they do need uh, uh, landlords um, and you know and unless they put their money in their uh, hands in their pockets and, and and come up with the goods around social housing and, and investment we're still be in exactly the same position and arguably you could you could argue that you know rents are at a 10-year high um, actually maybe you yeah, know maybe the returns are getting better for some people well, mortgage rates are at last, thank, thankfully, starting to come down. We're seeing Indeed. some sub five percent uh, buy to let mortgages now, and uh, rents continue to rise because of the supply demand imbalance. And uh, you know, we've had recent reports in the last two or three days that rents are set to continue to rise in into twenty. 24 so um i'm very much minded the same as as you ben and to be honest I, I i'm taking literally each day as it comes now um i've managed to actually have a couple of rent increases um this month uh which, which does help um but you know it's that uncertainty uh, certainly for a change of government uh is, is very concerning um and Sometimes, if you're not sure, it's best to just sit sit quietly and see what develops. Um, but I think having the kind of conversations that we've had on Property Tribes around this issue, uh, it's very interesting to hear other people's point of view um, and how they're thinking, and it may help you develop your own way forwards that, that works for you. So I think this is another reason why Ben and I are very keen for people to interact together as landlords and get feedback and talk to each other, because it can really help you um, navigate your way through our sector, which is very challenging uh, for all of us at the moment. Going back to the tax issue, Michael Thomas has said which companies should be avoided for tax planning. Well, we won't mention company names, uh, Michael, because it's not the actual company, it's the method um, that is being uh, recommended. And the method that we are talking about that HMRC 
has come out with what's called a spotlight on um, is is the hybrid method of tax planning. And there's lots about it on Property Tribes. Just put hybrid into the search engine and you'll be able to read all the discussions. Um, So, yeah, I think it's um, we're coming to the end of the year now as well. People are kind of winding down for Christmas. Uh, Maybe we should just see what what uh 2024 holds um that will be my goodness knows what uh yeah that'll be my 20th year as a portfolio landlord um okay this is a good one ben um Mm. the two um oh i've had a mental block what their names are uh the two chaps at um property hub They've done a podcast recently uh, and they have been talking about property strategies that no longer work. Uh, And they came up with the following lease options, aggressive uh, refinancing, buy to sell, otherwise known as flipping and developing. And they said uh, two strategies past their prime are HMOs and holiday lets. And they are of the belief that the only evergreen strategies that are working at the moment are buy and hold for the long term and adding value. Um, just wondered what you you thought of, of their list. And I just wanted to actually say, I, I would add rent to rent to non-viable strategies um Mm. not because of how it works but the fact is that tenant demand is so incredibly strong why do you need to go to a subletting um tenant you can have your own tenants and you'll have a very wide choice of tenants in fact i'm just putting another property in uh hybrid in islington on the market for rent and i've been told by the agent it should let within 48 hours because there's such massive demand so strategies ben um what's it what's your kind of takeaway on 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 those the two the two robs that's it sorry guys i should remember (laughs) i was just going to jump in but yes the two robs um uh, uh, it's funny um certainly the 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 hold for the long term is one that i um have always gone by to be honest with you yeah i've got i'm 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 vanilla you know, uh, there's nothing um, uh, exciting about you know my type of investments. Not not a euphemism, um, but uh, you know, I I I do have properties in the HMO sector, as I as I've said, um, I, and I've never thought about. Um, I have had I have added value to them. I've I've gone up. I've gone out. I've made I've made more more uh, more rooms. So that's certainly a strategy that's worked for me. Um, but I've always considered things over the longer term. I'm probably not brave enough to do some of the things that others have done in terms mm. of, you know, buying at auction and flipping very quickly and that sort of thing. Um, that that doesn't appeal to me. But certainly, I would endorse the, um, you know, the the the, the stick uh, for the long term strategy because what I do hope, and I said this about COVID, and you know, now we're in a, a slightly different era now. What I do hope is that with the sort of demand that we're seeing, that actually if you look at some of these things and the uncertainties and the ups and downs and so forth, that that's much more um, easily rectifiable over the longer term. It feels pretty crap, you know, at the time that it happens and there's a lot of worry and we're in that time at, at the moment. And my job is not to, to scaremonger, it's to, you know, um, is to, influence and and make sure that we're here for the for the longer term um but actually if you do look at things over the longer term i think the impact of them will be less and that's why i would absolutely endorse that um uh, that, that that approach mm, i think risks are very significantly amplified in the current market conditions uh and some of those strategies are much higher risk i mean lease options I don't regard it as a, as um, a strategy to be used in residential property property at all, to be honest. Um, and uh, you know, it's not something that I would ever consider. I'm very like you, Ben. I'm very low risk, uh, and I stick to what I know, and um, I take a very long term 
view. Um, and I think that's the safest way uh, to, to move forwards. Um, we've got a comment here from Patricia. She says she's not incorporated and she's been selling properties over the last five, five years. Um, she's now reduced to half the number and she's got no mortgages. Yes, I'm mm -hmm. sure that's going to work better for you, uh, mm -hmm. Patricia. Um, you're in a very uh, safe and stable situation, in my opinion. So well done for, for getting yourself in that position. Um We've got and that sort of rationalisation, Vanessa, I think is something that people are thinking about. I yeah. think people are, are you know, I, th I recognise that very much as a strategy, which is, you know, sort of paying things down, rationalising the portfolio uh, and, and getting to that sort of position where you're less reliant on some of these external factors like interest rates and mortgages and, and all of that sort of jazz. So, yeah. Yes. Rationalisation. That's a good strategy. Mm. <laughs> um Anonymous attendee, in terms of the hybrid model and the um, Spotlight 63, do you think it's game over despite all the discussions and the appointment of a KC? Um, I, I, I'm sorry to say I believe it, it is game over for the hybrid model now. Um, I think now that HMRC are actually contacting individual landlords uh, and inviting them to uh, you know, come into a dialogue with them, I, I do think the writing's on the wall. Um, any thoughts on that one, Ben? Yeah, I think it probably is is on the wall. Um, I'd be very interested to see, in light of the the cases that have passed muster with HMRC before, and if these ones that are being pulled in now don't, I'd be very interested just to sort of understand, you know, the the, the difference and the rationale um, that they are are adopting. But it does feel like um uh the the writing is on the wall for sure mm. and obviously we've had uh, dan nadal do his uh scrutinization of some of these schemes as well uh and uh he may well have um you know brought them to the attention of hmrc we don't really know uh but we do know that hmrc do um, frequent events and go on forums and Facebook and things like that and see what landlords are talking about. So if there is anything going on that's uh, going to be of interest to them, it, it will, you know, come into their onto their radar at, at some point. Um, so, you know, do bear that in mind. Um, we've got uh, one one final quick trending topic. Um, my tenant is not allowing access for maintenance. Um, this this is a bit of a, a landlord FAQ, isn't it, Ben? Because it does happen mm. a lot. My personal feeling is when a tenant doesn't allow maintenance, um, it, it's a bit of a red flag. They may have a legitimate reason that they don't want uh, somebody coming into the property. They could be a shift worker. They could have a new baby, something like that. Um, but then there could be some... Uh, rather more illegitimate reasons such as they could be subletting, they could have an unauthorized pet, um, they could be a hoarder. Um, but, you know, when a tenant won't allow access, um, it, there's actually not many things that landlords can do. Uh, and the kind of general consensus of opinion is that it, it, it's probably best to, to serve notice. Um, I don't know if, if you have a, a view on that. Yeah, well, I've just been, as I said, talking to Dr. Julie Rugg for one of her latest research pieces, which is about criminality uh, in the private rented sector on, bo on both sides. Um, and uh, this absolutely is a red flag for me. Uh, um, I'd, I'd want to know, um, uh, you know, why access is being uh, refused, particularly for something like maintenance. Sounds a bit dodgy to me. Um, uh, and perhaps before you serve notice, trying to trying to get to the bottom of that. Of course, and, and, yeah. And, and making it, but making it clear that, you know, if you can't get in to be able to do whatever it is that, that's needed, um, you know, you're going to have no option but to give notice and it's a route that you don't want to go down but I need to get in and I, I want to accompany whoever's going in actually because I'd want to 
I want to satisfy myself that there wasn't anything kind of, uh, you know, it's not turned into a knocking shop or a, a drug den, uh, which is uh, often, well, not often, but certainly one of the things talking to Julie about is is something that people pr prevent others from going in because of what's inside. So I would definitely uh, ask a few more questions um, and make it clear that you mean business um, in terms of uh, notice being the, the ultimate sanction if you can't uh, resolve it informally. Mm. Agreed. Okay, well, those are our sort of um, main trending topics of this Landlord Lens webinar. Um, we've got about another five minutes, so I'd like to invite everybody, if they've got any questions, uh, to pop them into the uh, Q&A. Um, and Ben and I can just answer a couple now. Um, let's see. There's one here, Vanessa, about um, asking us why we think landlords are so poorly uh, thought of. Uh, which I thought was uh, an interesting one. Um, well, do you know what? I, I don't know if people saw um, uh, Michael Gove at the dispatch box uh, recently, but he was at pains to recognise um, that the vast majority of landlords uh, do an excellent job. Uh, those were pretty much uh, his words. Um, uh, it's a great pity uh, he hasn't been able to say uh, those things uh, earlier uh, uh, than, than, than more recently, but um, there we go. Um, I, I do think a lot of people have a bad story to tell about their experience in the private rented sector. And this folks is one of the, you know, the difficulties when it comes to reform uh, that, you know, uh, we look at, we look through uh, the issues um, in a particular way. And from our perspective, we see really good landlords that are looking after their tenants that are doing the right thing that are treating people fairly and all of that sort of stuff and keeping up with the law but i have to acknowledge there is a part of our sector that brings it into disrepute and that's you know that's shelter and and others that are highlighting that sort of sharp practice that that frankly does us no favours, to be honest with you. And that's why, you know, we do call for things like uh, robust enforcement, because actually flushing out bad landlords from the sector is helpful for everybody. But it cannot be done to the detriment of those that are doing a really, really good job. And that message is getting through. because so I see, you know, things like the property portal, Vanessa, that's going to be brought in. There's a really positive way of landlords being able to show that they are compliant, um, a fit and proper person and, and all of that sort of stuff. But at the same time, what it will allow um, uh, local authorities to do is to really target their enforcement uh, away from the good guys and girls uh, and, and more readily uh, using the data sources that are there to identify the bad ones. Mm. Um, so I, I think, you know, as a, as a, a group, I don't think we've helped ourselves um, uh, uh, so much. Um, but now is the time to separate those two groups and pull away the, and make the point that there are two groups of, of landlords out there and we're the good guys and we can, you know, we can, we can help uh, government achieve its ambitions and, and uh, provide decent and safe accommodation. Mm. Well, I, I would like to sort of play devil's advocate a little bit because there was a story in the paper, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, it was a single mum with three children, two grandchildren and three chihuahuas living in a house that was damp and mouldy. And the pictures of the property were very, very concerning, the level of damp and mould in there. Um, and of course, you know, the media is looking for clicks, they're looking for attention and a story saying, I'm living in a lovely, comfortable, warm home provided by a responsible landlord isn't going to be very interesting. So they're always going to go for the most extreme case. And this was certainly an extreme case. But the other side of the story was that the landlord said that the tenant had been refusing access to deal with the damp and mould. So I think there's always two sides to every story. And unfortunately, the media will offer ju often just focus on the tenant side of the story and not actually uh, bring in um, various different uh, 
processes that may have gone on where the landlord was was trying to be responsible. So, um, yeah, I think the media are looking for clicks. They they want the most extreme stories they can find. Um, they get a lot of people thumping their chests quite rightly if um, we hear these terrible stories of, of damp and mould and you know, retaliatory evictions, which are actually illegal and shouldn't be allowed to happen, but you know, it still does. Um, and unfortunately it does, it does paint us in a bad light. Um, the other thing I was going to say, Ben, was, uh, you know, my, my old hobby horse and forgive me everybody, but we do have these wealth creation gurus who are all over social media saying you'll be a millionaire in a year uh, with no money. Uh, and you'll be driving, uh, you know, a Ferrari like I am, and you'll be living in a mansion and you'll be going on a world cruise and all this kind of thing. Um, they actually nothing to do with our sector at all. Um, they're what I call the wealth creation industry. Unfortunately, people outside of our sector don't realize and think they're just wealthy landlords who are taking advantage of tenants. Um, and they give us a very bad uh, reputation with the media. And quite a few media have picked up on some of these wealth creation gurus and talked about them as if they're their landlords and and it's very unfortunate that they can't see the distinction anything to add um yeah i i, I mean i agree with that vanessa and i think that um yeah you know that they're they're, they're they're not landlords and it's the same with with other characterizations uh, of of individuals you know um talking to 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 Julie uh, earlier I was making the point that you know she was talking about criminality um and and criminal landlords at the end of the day just criminals you know um uh, who just so happen to be uh you know using property and or renters as a means to execute their criminality it's as, mm. it's as simple as that we just have to get the right categorization I think Yes, I think we do. Um, Leslie Hall says, why can't Shelter understand that rogue landlords don't comply with existing legislation and they won't comply with new legislation? She says it's so frustrating because it's the good landlords that will leave and will be left with a higher proportion of, of rogue or criminal landlords. Well, I mean, I simply put, it's, it's, it's not in their interest to. Um, and, you know, you take the, the, the hearing uh, this morning, you know, we we we're in the middle of a housing crisis. We have a desperate shortage of properties, and actually, what the shelter want? Well, what they want is um, the time frame for reletting a property. So, if you do give somebody notice to sell or to for your family to move back in, if you then subsequently don't do it. Um, they want that increased from a three-month window where you mustn't do it to a year. And you know, and I pointed this out at the select committee earlier in the year. Is this right that a homelessness charity is saying that in as well as there being a 30 gram fine, by the way, for doing it, it's a very significant fine that tenants will be better off by having that property empty for a year than having a place to live. I mean, madness. Mm. Madness. Indeed. Well, we've got one final question. Uh, John Beaumont, he says, Hi, Vanessa, we met briefly at the NRLA conference. We did indeed. Hello, John. Uh, he raised a point with me about pets in HMOs. Um, and I, I thought this was such an interesting question. If we have a, a default position for pets, what's going to happen with HMOs? Because you could have a kitten in one room and then you could have a Rottweiler dog in the room next door. What is going to happen, Ben, do you think, in terms of pet legislation for, for um, HMOs? No, I think it would be pragmatic. I don't think it would differentiate between HMOs, but the the briefing, uh, I don't think pet, I can't, pets didn't come up specifically at the hearing this morning um at john but in my written submission i uh, and i'm looking at it now i raised the issues of not specifically in hmos but where you've got more than one interest so if you've got you know two or three tenants whose rights prevail <laughs> 
um uh you know so if you've got somebody that wants a pet and, and somebody that doesn't want a pet i normally adopt the approach that uh, as long as everybody's happy uh in in the hmo and i'm granting permission for one pet one specific pet not a blanket menagerie or zoo of uh, of creatures uh, and again i've asked for that to be tightened up in the wording of the bill too whose rights does prevail i i th- Honestly, I, I I still fail to get too excited about this because I'm very much of the view that landlords know what's best for their properties and will take sensible and practical steps um, uh, to manage this. And that's why the guidance that needs to accompany this um, needs to spell this out. Uh, and that's what I've I've said to the committee um, mm. in written uh, evidence uh, ahead of my appearance mm. this morning. So sit tight, we've got this, watch this space. Mm. Well, I think you've just highlighted there that the devil is so in the detail. And a lot of these headlines, once you start to dig down and get into the nuances of them, uh, you realise that they're just totally impractical um, in certain niche areas, um, as with the, as with the pets um, issue. Uh, and it's so good that that you're there, Ben, digging down on this detail and and pointing out where there there are what are actually flaws in potential new uh, legislation. We'll have one more quick question. I don't know if you know the answer to this. It's a pet question. Tracy Sidaway. She has a tenant that has an XL bully dog. Does she need oh. to get proof from them that they've registered the dog with the new dangerous dogs exen- exemption scheme? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, I don't know what the official position, I'll be honest, uh, is. But as a responsible landlord, it, it, given that you know that that dog is in the property and you know that the law, uh, I don't know whether it has changed or is going to be legislated for. I think you'd want to take some reasonable steps to make sure that your renters are complying um, uh, with it I don't think I think that would be a good thing to do regardless well that's the sort of question that's ideal for um, the NRLA landlord helpline uh, which I call phone I call it um, phone a friend for landlords um, and they're open I think from nine to five and also on Saturday morning um, and if you've got any questions that you need uh, an answer to um, that's one very quick and easy way to jump on the phone and speak to one of the the reps uh, on the end of the line. And Ben, you know, I've been up to uh, your head offices in sale and, and heard these guys in action. And there really isn't a question out there that I, I, I that they've never had to answer. They're just absolute mines of information, yeah. aren't they? Well, it's certainly an area that we have invested in, uh, Vanessa, significantly. I mean, you know, without being too geeky about it, we, we, we're getting somewhere between two and two and three thousand calls a week. You know, it's a significant part of what we offer. Uh, and, you know, for the 85 quid uh, membership, I'd say it was pretty good. I've got over, I think I've got 33 call handlers, um, uh, three team leaders. A, it's a big area for us and it's about making sure that our members uh, are supported uh, and know that they're not going to wait uh, forever in the day for someone to pick up the phone they're going to speak to somebody that knows and if they don't know there and then we've got a specialist team uh, in the backgrounds uh, background that that supports them as well so for those that aren't a member I mean seriously get involved please join up um, uh, and yeah I hope if you are a member you're enjoying membership Fantastic. Well, Ben, I'm I'm not sure. If, are we going to do another landlord lens this year? I think we were vaguely talking about doing one in in early December to kind of review the year. So, and maybe yeah, so, it's only in two weeks' time. Early I know, December. That's you realize so this. scary. Oh God, dear, oh dear, I can't believe it. Uh, we should try and fit something in before Christmas and wear a, a Christmas hat. I think, uh, and, oh, I and like have a little bit of a that. roundup. Um, and I've certainly got other other meetings to sort of report back on. The reason I was late today is I was meeting with the master of the roles office about court reform and digitalization and trying to have a bit of a pincer movement on uh, how we can uh, influence the agenda from the judicial uh, perspective as well. But there's lots of things that we're doing in the run up um, uh, to Christmas. And, you know, we'll come back in the new year. Uh, reinvigorated and ready to fight the good fight so yeah let's get something in in the diary awesome 
Well, thank you to everybody who has joined us today on the November edition of The Landlord Lens. Thank you for all your questions and your interaction. We really do appreciate it. Um, and Ben and I will hopefully be back uh, in December with a kind of roundup of the year and what landlords can look forward to in 2024. I can't believe how quickly it's coming around. Um, but for today, um, it's goodbye from myself and goodbye from Ben. And thank you very much for being with us on the webinar this afternoon and we'll see you next time take care folks